Hey y'all, and welcome back. And if you've been following along in this entire course, we've covered basically all of the brushes, but we've got a few left, and those are the yellow brushes. And I don't wanna talk about those yellow brushes until I've talked about how to make sculptures that kind of really matter, or that look really cool. So the problem with sculpting digitally is that the product that we're actually working with, the mesh that we're, or the clay that we're working with doesn't actually exist. So in order for the models that we make and the sculptures that we make to be accurate, we need to have a number of vertices in that area to give the accurate depiction of what we're trying to create. Well, we have done that so far because there's a lot of vertices by default in this area. And so you can see there's you know, a decent amount of vertices, but those vertices are all aligned in a quad sphere pattern right now and not in the direction that we want. And if you watched the jack-o'-lantern video, when I went to go ahead and make the stem of the pumpkin, we ran out of vertices because I couldn't get enough vertices in that area. So to fix that, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about something called dynamic topology or DIN topo, or if you're coming from another piece of sculpting software, you might know it as adaptive sculpting. Basically, all of those terms mean that as we sculpt, we're going to generate the topology that we need, the vertices, the faces, the edges, all of that, that we need in order for the detail that we want to be applied to that area. So now that I've kind of given you an understanding of what uh, dynamic topology is, we're going to take a look at how it works, all the different settings and everything you need to know to use it effectively as we go forward with our sculpting course. All right, so dynamic topology, as I said earlier, generates new mesh vertices, edges, and faces as you need it, which is really nice, um, but it can also cause some weird problems. So we're gonna look at how it determines how to create that topology and how to use each of those settings effectively. Now you can turn dynamic topology on in two ways. You can use the hotkey, which is control D. So control D for dynamic topology, or you can come up to the top and simply hit that checkbox. When you hit that checkbox, it'll just turn on. But sometimes you'll get a, a little notification pop up and say, hey, there's some data on the vertices that we already have in place. And that data is not going to be maintained if you use dynamic topology. And that's generally okay. Uh, you shouldn't have created any UVs or added any vertex colors or anything like that. When you go to sculpt, you should do your sculpting first. So that shouldn't be a problem, but sometimes it can be. And so they just pop up that notification and you can just kind of click away from it. Now, dynamic topology has like a few detailing methods. And we're gonna talk first about the default, which is this relative detail. So relative detail has a detail size and a refining method. Now the detail size is basically just the maximum edge length on mesh. So if edges are smaller than 12 pixels, they will be written over and topology will be recreated so that those edges are now exactly 12 pixels in size. And if you go and the edges are bigger than 12 pixels, they will be broken down and kind of cut down to match that 12 pixel size limit. So the detail size is just how big do you want your edges to be? All right, now relative detail works uh, kind of in two ways. So if we hover over it, we can see that mesh detail is relative to the brush size and the detail size. But what relative detail really means is that however close you are to your mesh is going to determine how densely that geometry gets populated. So if we're way out here, these edges that we can see in, ed, uh, in edit mode right now are much, much smaller than 12 pixels. So if I go and make this kind of circle shape here, what's going to happen is those edges that we once had are now rewritten. And so you can see that the density of the geometry and topology 
in that area where I drew over is now significantly smaller because all of those vertices that were really close together have now been overwritten to get 12 pixels in length. So now we have all of these. But if we zoom in, and we just move over a little bit, and we zoom in, let's say, uh, maybe a little further, and then we do another stroke, and say we make a heart shape this time. These edges have been cut in half because they were over the 12 pixel size limit. And so they've been dropped down and limited to now just 12 pixels. And so the density of vertices is a little bit uh, more dense. And if we zoom in even further, in fact, let's zoom in like super close here. And we make this same heart shape, this small. And then we go back to edit mode. Look at the density that's there. With relative detail, it takes the detail size and says, I'm going to generate topology that is exactly that size. And then however close you are to your mesh when you're sculpting it will determine how densely that topology gets generated. So when we're super zoomed in, we get super dense detail. When we're slightly zoomed in, we get less so. And then when we're way out here, this gets just overwritten and mesh gets mostly deleted and then reconfigured in the shape that we want. Now, all of that is great and has some uses, especially if your mesh gets super dense, you can zoom out a little bit and kind of go over it and relative detail will pull a lot of vertices away. And that's a pretty quick trick to just um, eliminating some extra vertices that you don't need that aren't really adding any real detail level to your model and they can actually speed up your, your computer's processor as you try to go through this super dense mesh. So that's relative detail. Now we're gonna take a look at constant detail. All right, so unlike relative detail, which was determined based on how far you're away from your mesh, constant detail is based on world size. And so what you're gonna see is a resolution here. Now you can change this resolution by default, it's three, but let's show you what happens when we sculpt over an area using constant detail. Now that resolution size is very uh, big at this point. That's removing a lot of detail for us. And maybe that's not what we want. So what we can actually do is we can grab a detail section. So maybe we want to uh, grab this super small area down here. And now we can see that the resolution is 279.3. And if we draw that same area again, Blender's going to take a little bit of time to generate that stroke. And if we look at that area that it generated by tabbing into edit mode, you can see that it's generated a crap ton of vertices here because it's trying to match the density down here. And regardless of where we're at with constant detail, we can be super zoomed out as you saw and get that level of density, or we can be super zoomed in and get that level of density as well. All right, and it really doesn't matter the brush size because wherever we make our stroke, it's going to generate that topology. Now I see what that looks like now. Yeah, so because I made that stroke there with the brush size way up, it's generated a lot of topology and actually Blender is starting to lag a bit. So one of the things I'm going to do real quick is just go back to relative detail and then just undo that. Now it's gonna take some time to remove all of that detail that it had put in there. And we'll go ahead and remove this as well. And it's going to undo that, which is really nice. And now Blender isn't going to lag as much when I make my strokes and it'll do everything just fine because it's not having to calculate that many uh, vertices in their new positions. So I just wanted to show that off to you, but that's how constant detail works. So whether you're zoomed in or whether you're zoomed out, the resolution size is always going to be the density of vertices that are created when you make a single brush stroke. So now we're gonna talk really about the last of the detailing methods, and that is brush detail. Now, you do have manual detail. Basically, manual detail allows you to uh, do a bunch of strokes, and then when you do a flood fill, then it will update all of that detail 
across your mesh all over because it's a flood fill and it just, it won't change things uh, as you go. So the last one that I really use is brush detail just because it's, I think the best of them, but I used relative detail for a long time before I got comfortable with how brush detail worked. So as its name suggests, brush detail determines the detail size based on your actual brush radius. So right now you can see the detail percentage is set to 25%, which means that whatever my brush radius is, it's going to create detail that is 25% of my brush size. So if my brush size gets really small, then the detail size is also going to be really, really small. But if my brush size gets really big, it's going to generate mesh in a really large detail size. So I'll just show that off to you real quick. We'll go with a brush detail of a small detail section and you can see, and then a large detail section and you can see the differences when we toggle into edit mode. All right, now brush detail, like I said, I think is the best of these because it means that if you need to get really fine and precise in the detail sections, let's say you're working on a face and you wanna use the crease brush, to kind of put those wrinkles on their eyes or like give them crow's feet or laugh lines or whatever, you can use brush detail to get real small details in there just by making your brush radius small and the topology will follow. And then if you just need to do large brush strokes and create topology that's pretty big, you just increase your brush size. I think it's the best one. It's the one that I use the most of, but that's how the detail methods work. So now we're going to talk about the refining methods and pretty much why you should never leave subdivide collapse. All right. So with the refining methods, we have subdivide collapse, which subdivide collapse is basically a combination of subdivide edges and collapse edges. But I want to talk about what those two do so that you have a solid understanding of what subdivide collapse does. So subdivide edges will only subdivide edges to match the detail size limit. So if edges are too large, then it will subdivide them to match the detail size limit, which means that if we go over this area here, it's not really changing this dense area in the center. If we go over this one though, see, does it change? No, no, it does not because it matches the detail size limit. So it's not going to change anything. But if we make our brush smaller, then it's going to subdivide all of those edges and create much denser topology. All right, so this only matters because it's only going to subdivide edges that are too big. All right, so then we have collapse edges. Now collapse edges is basically the part that says, oh, that, that topology is way too dense. What I'm going to do is I'm going to collapse those edges and recreate something to match the detail size. So with collapse edges on, if I increase my brush here, I'm only going to change details that are too dense. It's only going to collapse detail sizes that are too dense. So if we go over this, it's just removing vertices from this area. All right, and then it's recreating it at a smaller density. And if we make our brush size even bigger, it's going to remove those vertices even faster. Now, now that we've talked about subdivide edges and collapse edges, subdivide collapse is the extra piece that basically does both at the same time. So if edges are too big, it's going to subdivide them. And if vertices are too small, then it's going to collapse them and that all of the vertices and edges inside that are going to be at the density set by your detail percentage or your detail pixel size. All right, those are the refine methods. If you want to, you can change it, but pretty much you never need to change your refine method away from subdivide collapse. All right, so we've talked about the detail size, we've talked about the refine method, and we've talked about the detailing method. So let's take a look at the smooth shading toggle real fast, watch what it does to the model. When I turn it on, everything is smooth and it's shaded smoothly. So it looks more like a finished product model rather than a rough sculpt. Some people prefer to sculpt with smooth shading on, I just prefer to toggle it when I want to see the final product and what it's gonna look like. And that'll help me really smooth out sections 
that I need to smooth out. Because if you look at this, right, you'll notice that, hey, some of these parts aren't as smooth as they need to be. So you can just smooth that out real quick. And you can't really tell that that's the case without smooth shading turned on, right? We can see these little indents and stuff like right here, but we don't really notice that they're wrong until we go into smooth shading and then go over them. All right, so that's smooth shading. And then basically we have one of the coolest features of dynamic topology, which is remesh. Okay, so remesh is important because when it generates topology, it does not always generate the topology equally when you have a mirror on. So right now we've got the mirror turned on on the X axis by default. So if I am making my strokes over here on the left hand side, when we look on the right hand side, we see the same stroke is there, but the vertice count might be different. The vertices and details might be in slightly different places. And so what you can do is you can say, hey, I know you've generated everything on one side to match the other, but because it generates things slightly differently occasionally, we're gonna go ahead and symmetrize them and remesh one side to the other. So we have some directions that we can choose from. We can remesh things from the positive X to the negative X, you know, or positive Y to negative Y or positive Z to negative Z or vice versa for all of those. So we're gonna do one thing real quick and I'm just gonna grab the snake hook brush just to kind of show you what this looks like and I'll turn off the mirror. So we're gonna take the snake hook brush and just kind of do things. And But now that the mirror is off, let's say, hey, we wanna symmetrize this negative X to positive X. If we click the symmetrize button, it goes ahead and generates what we did on the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And so now we have this kind of weird bullhorn looking thing. If we undo that and say, you know what? I, I made this change over on the left. I don't like it. If I switch over to the positive X to negative X and then symmetrize, that goes away and everything on the right-hand side gets moved to the left. Now, we did all these changes at the top. So what if I took positive Z and symmetrized it to negative Z. If we symmetrize that, now what we've done on the top has been duplicated down to the bottom. And we actually get this effect that I hadn't planned on, which is these double hearts here, which I think is kind of cute. Uh, that's basically everything you need to know about dynamic topology. The more you use it, the more you get used to it, the better you'll be at sculpting with it. And this honestly is one of the reasons why, even though I've seen other sculpting tools and I know ZBrush is the one that's out there, I really couldn't imagine leaving Blender sculpting just because of how dynamic topology works and how much I appreciate it during the sculpting process. So with that said, guys, that's all you need to know about the basics of uh, dynamic topology and adaptive sculpting. I'm Sir Pinkbeard. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in the next video.